determine consequence. You and I. And that's what we can. You've been sitting in my mind by the blueberry pond for years Waiting for a worthy man to be The right kind of crazy, the right kind of touch I've learned so much, baby, just wait and see I've learned the right way to hold you tight And save you from all those scary nights Alone I won't leave you, you will know how it feels to be the star of your show
conversations without feeling like we're going to say something that gets us thrown in jail because people happen to be offended. All right, folks, we are live with another Pang Burn podcast, number 53. I'm really excited for today's guest. <clears throat> I'm going to be speaking with Dr. Roman uh, Yampolsky. Uh, he's a uh, he's an author. I'm, I'm going to go through his, uh, his bio in just a sec, but we're going to be talking about artificial intelligence today and uh, some uh, uh, subtopics from that, like security and, and different things. Um. But first, uh, before I do that, uh, before we move on, I just want to urge you guys, encourage you guys to join us on Discord. You'll find our Discord link um, in the description of this video. Uh, we have conversations every day on our open mic sessions. Uh, we have our philosophy days, our science days, our um, psychology days. So we have uh, we have conversations all the time with people from around the world, uh, competing in different cultures, worldviews. Um, so yeah, uh, please join us on discord. And if you're not subscribed yet to the YouTube channel, please subscribe, uh, hit the like button on this video. But most importantly, out of all of that is hit the notification bell or you'll never see when we go live. Um, <clears throat> and I want you guys to know if you, if you enjoy this content. Uh, so yeah, let me, um, let me see if, uh, Dr. Uh, Roman is, uh, ready here. It looks like he is. How's it going, uh, Dr. Roman Yampolsky? It's great to have you today. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. Uh, so let's go through a, a quick bio, guys. Uh, Dr. Roman Yampolsky is a, a tenured associate professor in the Department of Com Computer Engineering and Computer Science at the Speed School of Engineering, University of Louisville. He is the founding and current director uh, of the Cybersecurity Lab and an author of many books, including Artificial Superintelligence, A Futuristic Approach. Dr. Yampolsky has also authored uh, over 100 uh, uh, publications, including multiple journals, articles, and books. Um, very exciting, and you have a lot of different uh, areas of interest here that I want to get into. Um, but but first, uh, wh uh, how, how are things going? How are you dealing with the, uh, the uh, pandemic here? 
I mean, it's not too bad. Winter break just started, so we're yeah. doing all right. Yeah. Uh, how about um, like from a uh, an educator uh, perspective? How how has it affected the educational uh, uh, standards of what your students are receiving? Has this gotten gotten in the way? Right. So much of it is now hybrid courses, not uh, in person education. So yeah. a lot of it is online. But uh, I've been teaching online for a while, so in in certain ways, it's the same. For many new students, it's very different. Right. Okay, cool. Well, I want to jump into this question right away because it's something that people uh, tend to mix up a lot. Artificial intelligence versus ML, uh, machine learning. Um, can you explain uh, uh, the difference uh, for the audience? Right. So historically, then people like invented computers and decided to make them smart. They wanted to make them human-like, intelligent, and the field was called artificial intelligence. Uh, after a while, they failed, and uh, the name became kind of like inappropriate, science fiction. So they started coming up with other names, expert systems, uh, you know, cognitive systems. Uh, but really, it's just different names of the same same project. Uh, when they started getting into neural networks, artificial neural networks. Uh, that was uh, something different, a specific approach to AI. Uh, and that's what we know as machine learning. Uh, it became extremely successful in the last decade. And uh, that's uh, that's what we know right now as deep learning, as machine learning. But really, we're just getting back to, to the roots, to what AI always was. Uh, some people feel, OK, that name can never be recovered. So we have artificial general intelligence. We have super intelligence. But really, no matter what you call it, uh, we're trying to make machines smart. Right. Uh, now, would you say the missing factor between uh, the thing that would separate artificial intelligence from machine learning would be this <clears throat> kind of the missing element that we've yet to be able to replicate of consciousness, like that that first selector at the beginning of the consciousness chain? W would you say that's kind of what we're what we're still missing here? It has nothing to do with consciousness. Uh, we're talking about purely capability development systems which can solve problems. We don't really care if they feel anything. It has nothing to do with intelligence. That's a separate area of research we can talk about. But here we just we want to make them as capable and more capable as an average person. And uh, the big field using all the different tools is artificial intelligence. If you're concentrating on deep neural networks, you probably would call it machine, machine learning. Right. Wouldn't wouldn't we call though the emergent qualities of what that's going to look like to us? Like if it if it's very human like, are 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 we not going to call that consciousness to some degree? I hate the term consciousness, by the way, uh, because I don't think it has much explanatory power, uh, at least how it stands right now. But um, but isn't that something we would identify as conscious like at least? Uh, as you said, it's very hard to define or test for. So we can have a perfectly intelligent system, drives cars, plays chess, which has absolutely no internal states, qualia, right. consciousness. Uh, how would you know the difference? Right. That's, again, a separate area of research. I'm interested. I published on it. I have a test for how to possibly detect states of qualia, but uh, not relevant at all for just pure AI work or many safety concerns. Right. Okay, now I want to jump into this really meaty uh, question here that always comes up, and it seems to be the the the, the top um, subject with regards to AI or sub subject that's always up for debate. Are you in in a camp that worries about uh, the rapid advancement of AI technology where we wouldn't be able to catch up with it, or are you are you in the middle of this conversation, or are you on the side that of you know we're 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 the engineers, we can engineer these things so that they won't uh, ever get out of hand on us? So my work is specifically on safety and security of AI. I'm like the guy who worries the most. <laughs> So, but, but do you, do you catch yourself worrying irrationally at times because you're so focused on where it could go wrong? Like the possibility as opposed to the plausibility element of, of whether it's plausible that, that the, the creation will escape the engineer. 
So it's not so much about escape. It's about uh, like any other software. You design a good product and you have bugs in it. It fails. You have side effects you didn't intend. And we know that's a guarantee with every software product. I've never seen a software product with no bugs. So I think right. it's a pretty good uh, probability we're going to see something like that with AI. Well, bugs bugs are definitely going to keep you in in work because you're going to have to, uh, you know, be writing papers and 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 it's part of this is making predictions, right? Because uh, the AI um, bugs probably need to be taken with more caution than. Uh, you know, your typical machine learning bugs, like some of the bugs we see now, uh, viruses going around and things like that. Because um, it, it, you, if you're dealing with artificial intelligence, there's there's a level of, you know, you're, you're not wanting it to get ahead of where you are as the engineer, right? All right. And I kind of wrote about it before. So the difference between how modern systems fail and how a future system will fail. Right now, you screw up, you lose some privacy, credit card numbers get stolen, you get a new credit card, we move (laughs) on. If a system is controlling your stock market, nuclear response, consequences could be much bigger if it's either hacked or uh, miscalculates some sort of decision. Right. And, uh, and, you know, that would mean like like the, the Steven Pinker line of thinking here is that uh, the engineers who are engineering these things, we should have, we should be, we should build fail safes in, in these AI systems so that, you know, if they are to start becoming destructive, there should be a way to, to switch these off. Uh, is that something you think engineers can, uh, can create, uh, outside of the AI being able to figure a way out of it? So it's a very hard problem. Even detecting that it's not doing something appropriate is not trivial. So you have this very powerful system controlling complex environments, let's say medical research, biological research. It would take you 20, 30 years to realize the drugs you are getting or DNA engineering is not exactly what you had in mind. So it's not as trivial as, oh, there's a problem. Let me pull the plug on it. It's not the situation. Well, uh, yeah, well, you, you would think that an intelligent, uh, uh, an intelligence of any kind would take into consideration, uh, not wanting to get caught, you know, right. uh, deception. Absolutely. Right. And that's a big part of it. The treacherous turn, uh, where the system is doing supposedly what we want until at some point it's powerful enough to not care and turns on us. Right. Do you think, um, Artificial intelligence will kind of be, uh, it will be this emergence between humanity eventually, um, uh, where, you know, instead of coexisting, there will be some crossover of uh, cross contamination between human life and artificial, artificially, artificial intelligent life. So hybrid systems, kind of cyborgs will uh, make sense for a little while, as long as both systems have something to contribute. It makes sense. But we see AI very quickly do better than we do at everything. So you just become a biological bottleneck. You contribute nothing to the overall system and you get removed either explicitly or implicitly, but you no longer make uh, decisions. Right. What is the um, what is the thing that is going to like, like how how close are we to creating something that we can call artificial intelligence and what do you think is the is the key missing piece of the puzzle i'm sure there's many pieces but what is the key uh to to sorting this out and getting this getting the proper system in place that we can point at it and say that is artificial intelligence so it seems like the more compute and more data we have the better we do even without any breakthroughs or novel ideas. So if you take first ideas in AI, 100 years ago, initial ideas in artificial neural networks, you give them more layers, more data, more compute. This is the top idea today. Everything we did for 100 years was kind of like sideways, not direct progress. So it's possible, but not guaranteed that simply doing more of that, more compute, by like 2040, 2045 will get us to human level performance. Maybe not. Maybe we're still missing something that's not well understood. But so far, it seems like we're making very solid progress. 
just by adding more resources, computational resources. Yeah, when you uh, the 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 question I'm interested in answering, and I'm and I'm attempting to answer in my first book, is that not understood area of the emergent qualities of the the human mind, and uh, and and I would say of life in general, and trying to replicate that. Um, do you do you delve into uh, neuroscientific research much uh, as you as you move through this uh, AI puzzle? I have a lot of interest specifically in uh, similarities between artificial neural networks and natural neural networks. We see some similarity in data processing and kind of dreaming hallucinations, but I don't do active research in that area. Mm. And uh, you just mentioned dreaming. Uh, how, how has that emerged in your research with AI? So not my research directly, but uh, if we feed noise to neural networks or some weird patterns, we still try to recognize what, what it is, what the pattern is, and what we can kind of extract from deeper layers is very similar to human dreaming. You have all this uh, noise coming in at night and you try to make a story out of it. A lot of times it works out, a lot of times it's just nonsense, but there seems to be some similarity with, uh, with this process. Right. Um, now, what what do you think the the if you were to make some predictions here, what do you think the first AI um, entity is going to look like? Uh, like, as far as like, is it going to be a, a simplistic, um, you know, set of set of numbers, or are we are we looking at you know some kind of like uh, manifestation in something that we will be able to interact with like kind of on a human level or, or what what exactly does it look like because when i'm trying to imagine this uh of of how we would observe it and interact with it are we going to be be audibly uh interacting with it or is it going to be simply through text based uh language or or what do you think so it's a continuum from systems we have today all the way as we keep improving it's not a complete binary we have no ai oh we have ai Sure. So what we have today, just much better. Neural network, very large neural network, uh, language model can communicate through text, through speech, uh, just a lot more capable in generalizing decisions. So uh, now I want to switch to uh, uh, behavioral biometrics. So we have we have some system in, in place right now, like facial recognition, voice recognition, fingerprints and, and all that kind of jazz. But this is becoming much more advanced pretty rapidly, correct? Well, there is a lot of work in combining all the different modalities. So you have multimodal systems and behaviors at it. So it's not just uh, what you look like. It's how you behave, how you talk, how you walk. Interaction with computers is a big one. How you type, how you use your mouse. Right. And uh, what do you like? It, there, there are a lot of liberties taken in the advertising realm. Uh, in the marketing uh, realm online, uh, it is this going to be something? A lot of there's a lot of conspiracy theorists out there that feel like the algorithms are so smart on on Facebook that it they uh, they feel like that Facebook is reading their mind and delivering them ads that they're thinking. But really, I think people just underestimate how good the algorithms are at, at predicting what's what's going on based on how you click and how you behave. Um, do you think uh, the more we interact through through video and and the more opportunities these systems social social media networks have to read our behaviors like kind of we're we're engaging right now, um, it, is this going to be something you know sellable like from a security standpoint? Do you do you worry about this being kind of an infringement on people's uh, personhood or rights or anything like that? Well, the system definitely can learn your behaviors better than your friends know you or even better than you yourself can predict your behavior. So that, that's true. We already see that. Are you worried about it? It depends. If you don't want the system predicting your behavior, don't don't use those services. Right. If you're not worried, if you enjoy well-targeted ads, good for you. Yeah. Is there a, um, uh, speaking about uh, behavioral biometrics, what uh, what do you think will be the the most key um, feature to this for uh, future technology? Um, like, where will it emerge to be the the greatest um, usage for human well being? 
just the biometrics in general or recognizing sure. people yeah uh, so a lot of it would be useful for identity uh, verification authentication payment systems social interaction right now you have to deal with uh, passwords with uh, physical devices hopefully we can go beyond that right uh, and how often uh, do you engage in your research and your work? How long does, uh, or how often does genetic algorithms come up? I used to do a lot of work with genetic algorithms, not so much recently, but it's still a, a big area of interest of mine. Yeah, and uh, and that's. Can you explain how, how that how that uh, research went for you, or or how that came up? Sure. So uh, I, I teach artificial intelligence and one of the techniques in AI is to say, OK, we don't know how to do it. Let's just use evolution and evolve solutions to this problem. And that's what genetic algorithms are. They take a population of possible solutions, make them interbreed, kill off a bunch of them, repeat the process many, many times until you get pretty good results. And for many optimization problems, they're excellent. They're not really good at designing new uh, engineering blueprints, completely new designs from scratch. But if you need to optimize something like a car design or anything like that, excellent tool. I want to, I want to get your take a little more on if uh, even, even if you, you have to make a few uh, inferences and guesses, but what, what uh, you, you were talking about how we, we just need to get, get better at what we're doing right now. But there's a there's a there's a piece of this, um, you know, misunderstanding. Uh, there, there's not a proper theory in place of the thing that is going to, for us as humans, to look at something, a, a system, and be like, "Wow, that's that's human like." Um, what is that thing that's missing? It, 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 you're saying more of the same, but I, but I think there there is something missing there. So right now, systems we have don't have ability to generalize, something even children can do really well. Right. We're starting to get there, but it's still very, very early stages. And it has no true understanding. It does statistical analysis. It finds a pattern. But what we call understanding is not there yet. Common sense is not there yet. Right. And, uh, and uh, I don't know what you think about this, but in my, in my first book, uh, I'm wrestling with, um, a new theory that, that kind of deals with the, the, at the, at the start of what, what, what kind of pushes life forward. And I call it, uh, the pleasure drive. So basically it's, it's just, uh, um, creating a, 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 a theory and a, and an equation that basically, uh, deals with the thing that forces the biological entity to to do X, the the, the selection process. Because in neuroscience, it's like uh, we know that we're not, you know, coming up with our own thoughts. Thoughts are happening to us. So I think within that mystery, it, it seems to me that AI is going to have to have some system that is propelling it forward. Not not simply just uh, uh, propelling it forward for selfish feedback reasons, not not just for uh, reasons of this thing has to be calculated because. Does that does that uh, make any sense? What I'm saying? Not really, but uh, <laughs> uh, most of us have some sort of goals. Right. They are complex and they're dynamically changing. You don't have a simple goal of get the most pleasure. Right. If you look at what you do every day, you're not always going for the best drugs or the best pleasure resources. So there is complexity. You want meaning in your life. You want uh, pleasure is fine. Hedonistic reasons uh, with AI drives uh, we observe through evolution also show up. So you have survival. Right. If you're not alive, you cannot reach any other goals. So, so that's number one. You have to continue being plugged in. So that's where a lot of safety concerns come. You can't unplug the system, which has a survival drive. Mm. There is a whole list of very common drives, which we know any general agent will have. Preserving utility function, uh, keeping resources available, things of that nature. So the objections you just brought up to pleasure, I would call all of the, all of those things fall under the umbrella of what I call pleasure. 
the the pleasure the pleasurable pursuit to survive i don't think we i don't think we're going to drive towards uh survival if we don't find it to be a pleasurable pursuit if we don't get uh, you know an endorphin feedback for pursuing that but uh, so if you define everything you do as pleasure and that's everything you do then everything's pleasure what's the benefit of having that word well it's uh, it's it's a way to to map the selection process that's going on. Like if, like if someone says, if someone says, well, why did I move my arm like this? Well, the, for some reason, my, my, my neuro network, my neuro mechanism decided to give me that. Why, you know, and why, why was this movement? Okay. For, for the, perhaps there are social implications as to why I'm moving, moving my arm and what's driving that and what, why is that selected instead of me going like this and 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 not going like that? So, I, I I I think I and and you know perhaps you'll be interested in reading my first book, but um uh but I but I think that all of this behavior can be uh, linked to um, pleasure in 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 some way. So I, I guess I'm trying to come up with a uh, uh, a system that perhaps could be used uh in in ai uh research something something that ai may need to have uh doing this the selecting process for them for some kind of feedback reasons but but yeah so typically the idea comes from economics and ai researchers adopted the idea of agent maximizing utility the things you named give you a certain amount of points all of them you can call getting those points pleasure that's fine. Sure. But you're trying to maximize future utility you'll accumulate. Sure. Yeah, and I, and I you know and I think an important aspect to that is understanding that uh, biological entities will find pleasure in things that um, it's still self-serving, but it's it's something like helping out your neighbor, helping out your child, having children, like all of this stuff I think is is pleasurable pursuits not for all biological entities we find human beings that don't find this to be a pleasurable pursuit that's why i think it's it's individualistic but uh but i think we have general general rules and mappings that we can apply to this but uh but yeah that's interesting i wanted to um uh hear hear your thoughts on that um just to just to ask you something that perhaps people don't ask you uh, typically but i ask all my guests uh what inspires you artistically artistically yeah no i see science as art uh research paper beautiful research paper is a masterpiece sure yeah so just uh being able to enjoy a good research paper and hopefully produce one mm -hmm. that's as close as i'm gonna get to art i i i'm not an artist uh, my definition of art is if i can do it it's not art but uh i think with with research papers it's it's one part where i can try and do you uh, do you find uh, uh, when you're engaging in research, uh, do you find that using your imagination is a feature or a bug? Well, a lot of my research is about future of technology. So without imagination, I have nothing. <laughs> right. Uh, I just uh, I I think um, that you know the things that separate, let's say, uh, Albert Einstein. From the other uh, mathematical geniuses of his time would be his the the, the uh, his imagination and the artistic inspirational qualities of how he approached his work. Do you agree with that? Oh yeah, he could visualize experiments beautifully. I right. mean, really, you have a computer right here. You can do any type of simulation. You don't need to do yeah. much of uh, physical world experimentation just to verify results at the end. Uh, you just mentioned uh, computer in the mind. That, this is how I think about the mind as well and, and how I approach my work thinking about uh, the mind and, and the brain. Um, uh, what do you have to say to people that, that say, like, the brain is not a computer? Do you th <laughs> it's an argument about definitions. I mean, right. depending on how you define things. It has a processor. It has memory. It has all the components of standard Van Neumann architecture. Okay. Right. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I hear this argument all the time. Someone will, someone will say, "Well, uh, you know, we're making all, you know, billions, billions of calculations per second. And someone will be like, "Well, they're not calculations." Well, 
aren't they? <laughs> but what is the counter argument? They're they saying human brain can do uncomputable computations. Well, so it's, the... it's kind of a problem that I have with the term consciousness in general, where it kind of is like it's this system of general awareness and not this system, and which I think is wrong and, and not what I think is correct of this system of billions of states of potential being calculated like that and then it's a, and then it's so seeming it, it it's seamless that it it becomes cinematic to our uh, observation but sorry I, consciousness is a different animal i i don't have a very good explanation for why brains have consciousness that's that's right. a different question it is intelligence i can reduce to a computation but consciousness may be see more I, tricky. I think they're linked and I think we've 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 tripped over stones for a long time because we feel so special about the about how how intricate the emergent qualities of these calculations are but uh um I th I think we've created this special realm for for maybe no good reason. I um, think they are linked. I actually argue that as we get more complex systems they will have eventually more complex states of consciousness right, right. now they have rudimentary states but they do get to perhaps even super consciousness at some point now let's uh put on the predictor hat for a second uh and what how is this ai experience going to play out for humanity um is it going to be a, a net positive or net negative for human survival so long term, very long term, I'm not saying next year or a couple of years, if the systems continue to develop and they become as capable as we are and eventually much more capable, it seems that one thing is for sure, we lose control. They may be good to us, they may be bad to us, but we're definitely not the entity in charge anymore. And that in itself is a big, big change. And I think we don't allow most people to take a part in that discussion, not yet. So I guess I'll see you in the human zoo then. If they are into that, <laughs> maybe steak, ribs. See, this is what I, the, yeah, exactly. Hey, I, I wonder what human ribs taste like. Yeah, well, you, you know, look at chimps and monkeys, right? Uh, apes, apes and monkeys and the chimps have this, uh, have acquired this taste for monkey. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps we are the, uh, on the menu. Um, but I think that all has to do with the pleasure drive. What is the AI entity going to find pleasurable to pursue? Is it going to just want to disappear and exist on a radio wave, on a light beam? Uh, you know, it, 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 does it, is it going to want to just get away from the ape as quickly as it can? Uh, I think this so all... again, we can get back to the drives we talked about and take them to extreme. If you are, uh continuing to become more capable you you try to accumulate resources to protect your survival so if anyone's challenging you you would try to undermine them uh you may not have a specific goal like i want to collect coins very important i get all the coins that's <laughs> right. more of a human fetish but uh, just general drives which no matter what situation you're in no matter what happens later you're in better shape you have more options you are dominating so kind of this uh, trajectory of self-improvement yeah well i and i hope ai is engaging you know my 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 particular moral system that that governs me is maximizing well-being for myself and those around me uh much like the sam harris uh uh well-being uh model from the moral landscape um i hope that ai uh, has in its program uh a moral system of some kind uh, and I hope that it kind of mirrors what I have and it doesn't mirror something from uh, ancient Christian ideology or ancient, ancient Islamic ideology. <laughs> so the problem is we don't agree on what's good, even what's good for you. Sure. It's easy to see examples with children, right? My children want to eat candy. I want them to eat carrots. Am I the good guy or the bad guy? I prevent them from getting what they want. See, the, now now this is why I think my moral system is and, and the Sam Harris uh, moral landscape is superior because it actually calls on the scientific method to determine well-being the same way that we see, the, the same way that we do in the hospital and that doctors do for uh, doctoral care in medicine. We, we rely on the measurement of what is well for the patient, demonstrably well, not just what we, what we imagine is well for them or what we feel is well for them. 
Uh, so, so my moral foundation takes into consideration when it comes to maximizing well-being for, for myself and those around me. It relies on the scientific discovery of that, not simply just, you know, pulling it out of my ass. Yeah, but there's a still very difficult things to scientifically assess. What is good for a patient? Should you try another round of chemo or should you let them enjoy the last sure. six months of their life? Use science to figure it out. Go ahead. Yeah, no, well, no, I think we I think we can because I think the scientific method uh, in hospitals and for doctoral care takes into consideration the implications of of trying a, another round of chemo or, or allowing the patient another six months. I think that's part of the, the science in investigation investigatory nature um but, yeah, but those decisions are made by some sort of statistical approach right sure. an average most patient will get another week out of it so yeah. it's worth trying yeah and i'm not arguing that that moral systems aren't subjective i i i, I don't think there's any evidence of an objective moral system uh but the my moral system and the sam harris one has that caveat of scientific measurement for well-being at least the same way to the degree that we can in the hospitals and and uh, right so now let's say we succeed and we create a super intelligent system and it says, okay, I'm super intelligent. I calculated all the right moral answers. And it gives you an absolutely horrible thing to do. Just like you go, no no way this is the right answer. Right. What are you doing? Well, you, you know, you could come up with something like it It, it perhaps says, uh, it, uh, well, well, let's, say, let, let, let's give an example. Let's say if it comes up in its algorithm with that human being should be having sex with children. It's like uh, people would, people would be like, well, well, we can we can measure through clinical psychology that that it's not in the best interest of the child's well-being to be having sex with children. So we would be able to stand in opposition to the AI with a strong argument based in science to say uh, it, it, we ought not be doing this because of uh, our, our discoveries. Same with if we if, if we wanted to administer a diet to our ch children of only carrots, only give them carrots for their whole life. Uh, even if the AI algorithm came up to that, we would be like, well, our scientific findings show that a balanced diet is in the best interest of a, of a child's right. well-being, not not simply just eating carrots. So what you're saying is you'll be able to understand the theory and as an equal argue for it and against it. What I'm saying, the system is so much smarter, you have no idea what it's doing. You just don't understand it. Einstein doesn't get it. And it just tells you this is the right answer. Yeah, so you cannot compete. You cannot keep up. Right. So so if then we're talking about kind of the the master slave relationship, which I which I, I think it's something that you bring up a good point that it's something that human beings might have to wrestle with in the future. But I would I would say that before it gets to that point, we need to download our our ourselves into software form and kind of escape that that relationship and build our own, you know, it'd be our own matrix controllers, essentially. So that's an interesting approach. What happens when you upload yourself and become much faster, have much more memory? How are you still the same entity? What is uh, yeah. your identity? You're now a completely different animal. Well, yeah, when you become, uh, you know, it's almost a way to do, to escape determinism, uh, but not, not in the macro sense, because all of it's predetermined anyway, but in the micro sense, if you do become your own matrix controller within your own microcosmos, you can affect that that causal that that causal determinism. Let's do it not gradually but quickly. Right now, instead of you, I'm gonna have an upload with your name, which is completely different entity with different preferences, different substrate. Are you happy to be turned off right now because that thing is out there? Well, no, because uh, because it's a copy. A copy of me is a new entity. Uh, I still want to. I still find it pleasurable to exist, and and I, I view life as its own damn reward. And I don't want to lose my life just because we were able to make a copy. And and uh, you know, a, an interesting thing is if teleportation technology in the future means that you know I die but a new copy of me uh, is is composed on the other end with all of my pieces, but I have to die in order for that to happen. I don't think that that teleportation technology is going to be used by damn near anyone. 
Right, but you were suggesting this uploading as a solution to escaping control from superintelligence. I'm pointing out right. it's not helping you at all. You're creating more superintelligence that's out there. Yeah, so so it is it it only works for the individual if their experience is somehow transferred entirely. Uh, and and you know with with everything I am a full download yes there are models that say that's just going to be a copy it's not going to be you you're still going to be here but I I guess what I'm suggesting is that perhaps there will be a way to trick the human entity who's making the copy into thinking that they are in that system as well you know so a copy would be cool i'm saying it's going to be upgraded to the point where it's mm. no longer even the same species it has completely different desires and capabilities think about being a baby do you have any memories of being one month old no no definitely but not. because you gradually got here we claim it's the same person if it was an immediate jump of 20 yeah. years nothing in common yeah no, i know i i totally agree that it, but there are perhaps ways to program so that the human stays human within the new uh, 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 matrix cosmos that they get to be the gods of. Uh, maybe that can be part of the programming. But uh, so one of the solutions I proposed for multi-agent value alignment: How do we get all the people to agree on everything, all the morals, all the ethics? Is what you're saying: Give everyone a personal universe where they can do whatever the heck they want and uh, <laughs> just control the substrate. But then you will... Servers <laughs> have to stay on. But uh, that's one possible approach. Well, then uh, one thing that's going to come up there is you're going to have the activist. It, it, it seems to be human, human uh, part, of, part of our nature. You're going to have the activist that cares about the moral implications of what that human entity is doing in their matrix and their cosmos, in their game. Yeah. Right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And luckily, they're not part of my universe. They're in a different <laughs> universe, and they are the best activists, and they're very happy. They get all the funding. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, I really appreciated having you on, uh, Dr. Roman. Um, I, I would like to chat with you again, uh, perhaps when my book comes out. Uh, and uh, yeah, I. Uh, I, I Send really, me a copy. Maybe I'll give you a blurb about it or something. Yeah, cool, man. Uh, I, I really appreciate you coming on today uh, and on short notice. And uh, be safe out there. Thanks a lot, man. Yeah. Peace. All right, guys. That was Dr. Roman. That was uh, that was very interesting. I, I enjoyed that. Um, uh, Miguel uh, Perez says, first time tuning in. Awesome. I hope you subscribe and hit that notification bell. We're going to have many, many, many interesting guests uh coming on i really enjoyed jump uh, delving into these topics i expected um uh, dr roman to have more of an interest in neuroscience uh you know what we what we call consciousness which we don't know uh, a damn thing about uh as far as what it is um but i'm i'm tackling this in my first book uh, for those of you who don't know uh, i've been working a lot on it i'm going to be putting in some serious serious time uh, in the next uh, couple months here um, to try and get the first manuscript done. But, you know, I'm, I'm wrestling with that problem. The, the, the thing that sits at the beginning of the selection process as to what we think next, <laughs> what we think, what we, uh, what is dictating what's going on? Because we already know through neuroscience that thoughts are happening to us. We're not dictating them. Where are they coming from? <laughs> it's a, it's a fan, it's a fascinating topic. I've always loved it. I've thought about it as as early in my life as I can remember, uh, before I, I had even read books or or anything on the topic. Uh, but. Um, yeah, uh, really exciting. Uh, why does it say no data? Oh, weird. Uh, but thank you guys for, for tuning in today. This is uh, Penguin Podcast number 53 in the books. That was Dr. Uh, Roman Yampolsky. Uh, do follow him on Twitter. Um, check, out, uh, check out his books. Uh, fascinating guy. Uh, pragmatic, straight to the point. I love it. <laughs> this has been the Penguin Podcast and let art and science inspire. <laughs>